Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, Ishan. Uh, just to introduce everyone, um, my name is Rishi Jalan. I'm the founder and CEO of the Big Red Group. Uh, today, we have uh, the current chair of Harvard YLC Youth Lead the Change Program uh, called Ishan Prasad uh, with us here, who's going to sort of talk to uh, us about his life, what he's been up to, and how he got into Harvard. So, on that note, um, Ishan, welcome, um, uh, you know, for this conversation. Firstly, um, if you would like to just tell us a little bit about yourself. I know your uh, parents emigrated to the U.S., uh, you know, uh, a lot of years back. And if you could just start about where, where you live right now, where did you go to high school, and we'll take it from there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rishi. It's a pleasure to be here. Rishi and I um, have now known each other for a couple of years, and it's just been a blast to work together um, with Regret Group and YLC together. And so I guess starting from the top, you know, I was born in Boston um, at National Hospital. Um, I'm a rising junior at Harvard on leave for the semester. But before we get to Harvard, you know, I've lived in Boston my whole life. Um, I currently live just outside of Boston in Winchester. And, you know, growing up, I enjoyed playing sports. I kind of enjoyed doing a little bit of everything. Um, I went to, um, you know, a school in Belmont for elementary that transitioned me to an all-boys school also in Belmont called Belmont Hill. Um, I think Belmont Hill was an awesome experience, um, very much like, you know, my early childhood. Um, you know, it was a great opportunity for me to sort of get my hands in a bunch of different buckets and hopefully we can sort of dive into the things I did in high school at a later point in this conversation. Um, you know, but then uh, from there, um, I graduated and went to Harvard, um, where I can uh, concentrate or major in computer science. Um, and I have a minor or a secondary in linguistics. Um, and so as I sort of mentioned earlier, um, I'm actually currently on leave right now, um, working full time in consulting um, for Bain India. And so, for, you know, as Rishi alluded to, uh, my parents emigrated from India, um, first my dad in the 80s and then my mom in the 90s. Um, they went to undergrad in India and, you know, came to the U.S. for graduate schools. But, you know, ever since I was a little kid, we've been traveling to India at least once a year. And so it's been a real pleasure to now not only, um, you know, visit India to see family, but now to be working full time in India and to have that sort of opportunity to grow professionally as well. Um, and, and so with that, you know, I thought that's hopefully a good introduction to start and we can sort of dive into some questions and just catch up from there. Yeah, um, no, thank you, Sean. By the way, for everyone listening uh, to this, uh, a rising junior means a third year student. Um, and similarly, we'll talk about, I just wanted to get all the jargons out of the way in the beginning. So a freshman is a ninth grader, sophomore is a 10th grader, um, junior is 11th grade and your senior is 12th grade. And sort of the same chronology goes um, for your undergraduate degree for four years as well in college. So we're gonna be using a lot of these words. So I didn't want our uh, students and parents to get confused. So thanks for that, Ishan. So let's start with Belmont High, right? I went to Phillips Academy Myself, of course, we used to have a lot of uh, sporting competitions with Belmont High and then, um, you know, it's a private um, boarding school as well, if I'm, uh, uh, you know, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So if you could just start with your time at Belmont High, it was an all boys school, as you um, said earlier. Um, and how was your time there? Were you a, a very academic student in the beginning? And uh, how were you managing your sort of academic life and what were you doing outside of school? Awesome. Yeah, great place to start. I think before I begin, I thought I'd echo what you're saying, that there's definitely a lot of jargon that I get sort of um, used to using and let's definitely catch me at any point and we can hopefully debrief. One thing for sure is I'm actually a tour guide at Harvard and I was also a tour guide in Belmont Hill. Um, and so for me, a big part of it is I really love, um, you know, welcoming you know, members um, to our community. And I think that's hopefully gonna set the stage for if I do say something that you guys you think might be some jargon, let's definitely debrief and catch up on that. But, you know, diving into Belmont Hill, um, as uh, Mirshi alluded to, it was, uh, it's an all boys school that begins in seventh grade. 
And so in the New England area, there's a lot of these private schools um, that begin in seventh grade, which for a lot, you know, a lot of the rest of the country is typically non-standard. Typically, private schools, they might begin in high school. Um, but in the New England area, there's sort of been this tradition of beginning it in seventh grade and having like a six year experience. Um, and, you know, with that in mind, I, I remember we used to call our grades like forms. And in many ways, um, the experience that I had at Belmont Hill is kind of similar to the one that, you know, you might have at a boarding school in Europe or even in India. And so it was kind of cool to sort of see similarities between the schools that my parents attended when they were in India. And in many ways, what it was like at Belmont Hill, it was very traditional. We wore a jacket and tie. Um, we all played three sports. Uh, we, you know, had a, this really interesting teacher coach model where all of our teachers were involved in sort of our extracurricular and athletic lives. And it was, an, I think, a, as I sort of mentioned earlier, a really cool um, opportunity for me to sort of try my hand at a lot of different things. And I think, you know, Rishi, I think you mentioned earlier, like, to start it off, you know, like, what was it like when I was at Belmont Hill? Like, what kind of student was I? You know, I think that, um, you know, as a young kid onwards, I was a very conscientious student and I was always, um, you know, looking out for others and, um, you know, very diligent students. So I guess I, I, it was, I wish I had some more fun stories about my, you know, my rogue childhood days, but I think I truly was a pretty organized and committed student sort of even coming into Belmont Hill. But I think what Belmont Hill really taught me was how to, you know, re really uh, dive into, um, you know, being a strong and sort of prepared student. Um, and so, you know, right off the bat, coming into Belmont Hill, every single um, boy uh, would take Latin, ancient Latin. And I think that was an amazing experience, you know, as you know, you would talk to someone else who maybe didn't go to Belmont Hill, and they would ask you, you know, why are you learning a dead language? And I think um, it's really emblematic of the sort of philosophy of Belmont Hill, which is that I think that, you know, whatever you're learning, often like it might seem sort of cryptic or like ambiguous as to what the use is. But I think at Belmont Hill, there was a huge sort of focus on sort of, you know, whatever you're learning, having perhaps a broader meaning and, you know, the applicability of the liberal arts education um, was something that they really focused on. And so in the case of Latin, it wasn't just that we were learning the language for the sake of, you know, reading text, although that was a great part of it, but it was that the sort of critical thinking skills and the sort of general um, thought process that went into learning how to sort of read and translate and understand ancient Latin was really useful across the board for any other academic discipline and sort of anything else that you were doing in the world of problem solving. And I think it was that sort of, um, first introduction to what, again, I was calling liberal arts, but we can sort of dive into what that means. That was, I think, really exciting and really sort of got me thinking about wanting to pursue like a educational path that let me explore lots of different ideas. Amazing. Uh, so, you know, I was uh, planning to touch on these topics a little later, but I'm so glad you brought up Latin and how you sort of connected it to critical thinking. And then of course, you said in the world of problem solving. So we'll, we'll come to that because I know uh, you're doing a lot of that at Harvard right now with you, know, you being in, in sort of various groups, including the YLC. Uh, but if you can sort of, you know, there are a lot of students in India, Ishan, who are taking you know, French or German or studying languages. But um, I seem to think that, you know, there's a level, they reach level three, level four, and they sort of drop off and they're not able um, to figure out, you know, how much should they really follow up language. And, and we could come back to later on and as to why you're studying linguistics as well with a computer science major for a lot of Indian students and parents that might be, you know, two ends of, of, of a spectrum. But if you could sort of Talk about more about the broad liberal arts education. I remember at Phillips Academy, uh, one of my favorite courses were actually international relations and sports philosophy, uh, right? And, and we were actually learning about um, uh, Roger Federer's swing and how that affects philosophy. I mean, it was, it was very different. So how do you think, what kind of courses you took other than, of course, ancient Latin and how that sort of developed your critical thinking skills and what do you think are some of the key 
you know, subjects or things that you, again, as a high schooler right now, maybe four years uh, recap, what would you like to do again that you maybe missed out in, in, in your high school? Yeah, great, great questions. And so, you know, right at the bat, I think when I think about a liberal arts education, I think about an education that is sort of grounded in this idea that you have a really sort of broad base. And then from that base, you find opportunities to sort of dive deeper. And we can talk about it in the context of college. Often when we are giving tours, we talk about the liberal arts education as an undergraduate being like a T in a similar way as to what it was in high school, where by building that foundation, you're able to then dive in further with a sort of background and understanding to sort of help you win whatever sort of focus field you want to go into. But in terms of, you know, courses that I was excited about and interested in at Belmont Hill, um, I think Belmont Hill in that sense was sort of very motivated to make sure that all their students had a very broad education. And so in, by nature of it being broad by demand of Belmont Hill, like there, it was a pretty rigid curriculum where almost everyone had to take every kind of science and math all the way through high school and all of these different subjects. So I think any sort of typical school curriculum that people see, like I took all those classes, I took my, my AP physics and so at Belmont Hill, we followed the AP curriculum, which is, you know, by the college board. But if anything, it was just a rigorous curriculum in sort of my histories and my um, sciences and maths. Um, and I think uh, in particular, if I had to think about a course that um, I didn't take, um, surprisingly, it was computer science. I actually took, I never took a computer science course until I'd actually come to Harvard. That was my first time taking a CS course, and it was CS50, which we can talk about later, which was Harvard's, you know, kind of iconic um, introduction to computer science that has, you know, been sort of put on edX as a flagship online course and has now been taught to millions of people around the world. But actually at Belmont Hill, I had very little exposure in the classroom to computer science. Um, computer science itself didn't really come to the school um, until sort of my, even my junior year of high school. And I think it's primarily because, you know, for the longest time, Belmont Hill has been a very traditional, all boys prep school environment. And I think more recently, they've done, they've done an amazing job sort of innovating and sort of bringing the school to the 21st century. Then again, I actually, even though I never took that course, I am not, I wouldn't go back and take it, to be honest, because truthfully, I felt like what I gained from Belmont Hill was that sort of broader understanding of, from other courses. Because at the end of the day, I am a computer science major or concentrator, and I'm taking those courses pretty rigorously now. And I think to a certain extent, what I really enjoyed at the very highest level about Belmont Hill is that it didn't force you to specialize. And we can talk about that concept as well. But I really think that, you know, in this day and age, when you sort of, I'm sure for those parents and kids who are listening, some of them are maybe reading um, maybe a little too closely some of those blog posts and forums online. And I think there's often this conversation about, do you know, do you specialize or do you remain a generalist? And I think there's pros and cons to both, but at least at Belmont Hill, there was a sort of focus on the latter, you know, remaining a generalist because the thought process, at least at the school was at some point you will be specializing and rather than specializing at 14 or 15 or 16, you might as well sort of get that humanistic approach to studies so that when you do specialize, you've maybe even had some opportunities to sort of pick and choose um, an area of study that you actually really enjoy and, and maybe have already sort of checked out before. Amazing. So uh, thanks. Thanks for, for that answer, Ishan. Okay, so let's move sort of outside the world of, you know, your general classroom. And why don't you tell us, of course, I know, um, in, in, like in a lot of private boarding schools, it's sort of mandatory to play two or three sports and you have your fall, winter and spring uh, semester. And I'm, I'm not sure if Belmont Hill followed a tri-semester approach as well. Uh, but what were some of the athletic activities you were involved in throughout high school? Yeah. And what are maybe two or three things that you were really passionate at, you know, at the age of 14, uh, which you feel in, in, you know, in your own sense, took it forward um, outside of your classroom and made, made difference in your Belmont Hill community or uh, Boston area community in general? 
Awesome. So I'll start with the sort of sports question. And then if, in case I forget, definitely feel free to remind me if I missed any question. But starting with the sports, Belmont Hill did sort of follow like a three season schedule. And so my very first year in seventh grade, I actually tried out American football. And that was an awesome experience. I was on the offensive line as a left tackle. For those who you know watch or follow American football, Typically, the left tackle and the sort of offensive line are these big guys. And I was this scrawny little kid, um, but I guess I just needed a spot to be filled. Um, but it was a blast playing football. Um, I, I ended up switching, you know, the next year in the fall to cross country. And um, the thought there was, I think, the broader idea, and I, maybe I didn't even think about that at the time, but looking back, I'm so glad. You know, for me, it was trying out football was – just to try out something new. It was a, a sort of a sport that was very popular amongst, you know, seventh and eighth graders in particular, like almost everyone tried it. And I think I, you know, looking back, maybe I kind of knew going into it that I wouldn't play football long-term, but I'm so glad I got a chance to try it and to sort of meet friends through that sport. Um, and so that was my fall sport, football into the cross country. And for my winter sport, I actually – um, wrestled all six years of my time at Belmont Hill. And wrestling was truly, I'd say, one of the like catalyst experiences of my time at Belmont Hill. And for context, I came to Belmont Hill thinking I'd play basketball. I was a pretty tall kid, um, but the bas- I wasn't the best basketball player and the team was pretty competitive. So I ended up trying out wrestling. And um, it was um, such an interesting sport to me. Um, and I felt like in many ways, taught me so much and you know through my sort of younger years I played a lot of tennis and a lot of you know other sports I think my parents um really tried to get my my actually my twin brother and I we can sort of get back to that as well but um you know through all of this I had my twin along with me um which you know we played a bunch of sports and um what I will say was that wrestling the sort of lessons that I learned from it were I think so unique and I never learned in any other sport not to say that I didn't learn, you know, other things from them, but I think in particular, you know, for those who aren't aware, wrestling, we're not talking about like the WWE or any of that. We're talking about, um, you know, the amateur wrestling that you see in like the Olympics. Um, and I think what's a really interesting thing about that sport is you, you know, ultimately you're wrestling by your weight class. So you're wrestling someone, an athlete of a similar size and weight and probably a similar skill level and you're sort of the only two kids on the mat being watched by everyone. And it's really like a, a, a game of skill and strategy to figure out how can you take down your opponent to score those points. And I think that, you know, for me, it was, it was super stressful getting on that mat and wrestling in front of everyone. But that, that experience, like putting yourself out there, you know, just truly keeping yourself vulnerable to, you know, having everyone watch you, like, you know, make that endeavor. Um, I think that lesson of like sort of learning how to put yourself out there was so important for my own growth and for, you know, my own confidence. And that's why I think wrestling was one of the key experiences I had at Belmont Hill. And then finally, you know, I mentioned I played tennis. And so for my first half, my first three years at Belmont Hill, I played tennis pretty competitively, like all the way up, you know, by my freshman year, I was playing at the very lowest runs of the varsity ladder. Um, but it was actually my sophomore year that I decided to switch and try rowing at the school. And rowing has a really great history at Belmont Hill. They've done, they've been very successful for a very long time. And I thought it would be really cool to try it out um, because it was a sport that, uh, you know, I'd kind of heard about and I thought, you know, was kind of unique even in the area, but was certainly a very New England sport. And I had done a camp one summer and, pretty, you know, really enjoyed it. I wasn't the best, but I thought it was a fun sport. And so I, I tried rowing and I really enjoyed that. So I did that for a couple of seasons. Um, but all in all, you know, on the sports side, I guess I have a mix of, you know, sports that I really enjoyed and continued with all the way through. And, and you know, other experiences where it was about me, you know, getting to try something new for the first time. And, you know, after trying it out, maybe, you know, switching it over because it wasn't the perfect sport for me, but I think it was kind of cool to have that balance. And so that was a little bit of, about my sports. I think, you know, diving now into my broader passions at the school, um, for sure, as I mentioned earlier, I was very interested in the classics throughout my six years. And, you know, maybe jumping ahead to my final year, 
it was kind of cool to sort of have that academic passion be brought to a more extracurricular um, window where with my um, Latin teacher, who was actually my wrestling coach, um, we were able to secure an $11,000 grant to buy, purchase these ancient coins um, to create a numismatics, like a coin exhibit um, in our school. And for context, um, it was actually this professor of mine, he, he himself actually, he went to Harvard and um, was a classic sort of PhD from Columbia. Um, and his wife and both he and his wife were very involved in curation and in museum work. And so it was a really cool experience for me, I think across the board, the classics, I think at the end of the day, perhaps one of the biggest reasons for why it was such an endearing part of my time at Belmont Hill was that the department was so strong and that the teachers and professors in the classics were really motivated about, um, you know, creating a sort of classroom atmosphere that made kids feel like they were learning something cool and interesting. And I think the reason I highlight that is at the end of the day, it's my belief is that um, so much of the sort of your interests and your um, and like things that you're enthusiastic about are often defined by the sort of communities that you surround yourself with. And, you know, personally, I, you know, one class that I didn't enjoy as much was chemistry. I had an awesome teacher, but I just didn't think I was able to engage with the way he presented the material. And I think that had a big like uh, impact on my, um, you know, ability to like chemistry. And it's funny because you, I would go and meet other people in other schools who loved chemistry. And I think at the end of the day, it's not that chemistry is more likable than classics or, you know, vice versa. Rather that, you know, probably the environment that they were in for them was just better, more conducive towards them enjoying chemistry. In terms of other sort of passions, though, but now I've talked a lot about academics and sports. Um, at Belmont Hill, my, you know, some of my biggest passions were, were um, the school newspaper. I was involved in the middle school paper through, you know, my freshman year of high school. And then from there, moved on to our sort of upperclassmen paper called The Panel. It was um, a paper that was actually co-run by um, our sister school. We have a, an all-girls school who we kind of like partner with, and we wrote the paper together. And um, funnily enough, you know, as we went through, I really enjoyed it, and sort of my brother, actually. And it ended up happening where by my senior year, I was the editor-in-chief, and my brother was the executive editor. And likewise, in sort of a mirror image fashion, we had a pair of twins who were our editor-in-chief and executive editor from the Windsor school side, the girls' school side. But the panel, which was our school newspaper, was an amazing experience. In particular, you know, we really focused on um, journalism at the sort of level of our school and our school community, rather than sort of reporting about the broader world. And in, in besides sort of that part of events journalism, we were really interested in exploring um, the archives in our school's history. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about and sort of interviewing and meeting people who were sort of involved in the past sort of century of our, of our school, you know, being run. And that was an amazing experience that got me, um, you know, really interested in history. And to this day, I think we'll sort of get into it, I'm sure later, but history has been um, a big passion of mine that has almost, I've sort of, it's, it's obviously an academic passion, but it's been kept separate from my undergraduate studies. And, you know, it started off with this interest in digging through the archives for the panel and moved along into actually an independent study um, at, the, at Belmont Hill to learn more about the school's ties to slavery, which is quite a surprise given that for those who are aware of American history, the North is often viewed as, you know, the sort of free area back when there was the sort of fight between um, the Union and the Confederacy. But there, you know, ultimately the sort of Atlantic slave trade was um, a, a trade that every single party was complicit in. And so I got to learn more about Belmont Hill and, and sort of its connections there. And all of these sort of interesting, you know, th these uh, experiences in history ultimately have sort of culminated in me at Harvard, continuing to sort of dive into history and to sort of um, collect books and to sort of read about this history. So one of my passions is definitely um, thinking about institutional history and that kind of view. Um, and then in terms of maybe briefly just going over other clubs and maybe wrapping up my question there, I was, I was a pretty involved student at Belmont Hill and 
um, you know, I, I, I got an opportunity, I think it was really cool to, um, to establish a few clubs of my own. And so we actually didn't have um, a model UN program when I first came to the school, but I had done a camp when I was in eighth grade and I loved um, the experience of sort of role playing and being able to, you know, craft an argument and work with others. And so we actually, um, my brother and I founded the model UN program at Belmont Hill. And what's amazing about a school like that was they were very supportive um, and even like funding our sort of endeavors. And so um, we had a really awesome group of students, over 40, and we were a small school of only 400 kids. So it was a pretty awesome percentage of kids who were interested. And, you know, we got a chance to travel around um, the East Coast, actually, you know, all the way from Johns Hopkins University to Dartmouth to all these different university conferences um, to, you know, hone our skills and to practice debating. Um, and, you know, besides that, um, I was definitely just, I think, uh, a kid who really enjoyed his school. I was um, a class officer, a vice president of my class. So I got to help, you know, lead um, my class and in sort of initiatives that were form wide. And, um, you know, to this day, I'm still an alumni agent for the school. And so I try to be as involved as I can um, with the sort of matters that are going on at Belmont Hill. Um, and, you know, I think across the board, um, what Belmont Hill really did for me was provide an excellent foundation um, that was sort of built on rigor and also like, you know, sort of initiated this like intellectual curiosity that I think was perhaps like one of the like most important reasons why um, I ended up considering and then ultimately choosing Harvard as my university. Wow. Uh, okay. Well, I was just, uh, you know, writing the few things down that you were saying, and it seems like you did a lot outside of your classroom as well. So for some of our students and parents, uh, just to let you know on the uh, athletic side of things, uh, varsity basically means if you're making the first team of your of your team in any sport right and um, generally varsity is the first team and JV which is junior varsity is sort of the second string second team um, that plays for your school right Ishan is that correct exactly exactly okay. and what, um, what was amazing about this um, sort of system that we had set up and I think a lot of schools are trending towards this model is there was really a team for everyone at Belmont Hill and we have I think we have over 23 sports because everyone played a sport. There were tons of obscure sports that we all played, but in particular for those big sports, there was a team for everyone. And so in addition to sort of that top string varsity team and then junior varsity team um, at the younger grades, there were individual sort of grade level teams. Um, and then as well, we had intramural teams for those students who maybe weren't looking to compete interscholastically against other schools but rather just to enjoy the sport. And like I mentioned, there were tons of other sports. So you could do cross-country skiing or squash or, um, or you know, rowing or sailing and all of these sports that um, were quite uncommon, I think, across the board versus you could also do football or soccer or baseball or some of those more classic, you know, American sports. Got it. Um, at this point of time, um, also, I would like to ask about, which is very interesting in, in our conversation, was about your independent study, right? A lot of people in India, I feel, do not really understand um, uh, what an independent study might mean. And if you could just throw a little bit, you know, for a couple of minutes as to, because it was really interesting with Latin, with, you know, curating coins and sort of how that uh, yeah. went. And, and how can sort of Indian students work on one particular independent study, which, you know, I generally try to promote with my students and how would that work in, in a general sense? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think, you know, as a testament to that idea of independent studies, looking back, I guess, I maybe didn't even call it that at the time, but I feel like I had perhaps three major independent study experiences. One was that coin curation experience the second, and this is sort of in reverse chronological order, the second was um, that history experience, sort of examining um, Belmont Hill's ties to slavery, and in fact, Harvard's ties to slavery, because Belmont Hill was ultimately founded by a bunch of professors from Harvard, and so we had that connection, and that kind of got me interested in the school as well. And then my sort of third and sort of maybe my longest independent study experience was actually in science, um, in the field of bioinformatics, which is like a sort of 
uh, intersection between computer science and biology. Um, and it was working at a lab at Harvard Medical School, um, building sort of healthcare tools um, for oncologists or cancer doctors to better treat their patients. Um, and so, you know, we can definitely dive into those studies or those, you know, independent studies for if there's questions. But I think across the board to sort of answer your question about, you know, how do you get into that sort of opportunity? You know, certainly Belmont Hill was very um, helpful in sort of fostering those. They were, you know, very much like facilitating those experiences. But I think across, you know, more recently, you know, talking to friends in college and sort of hearing from, you know, their experiences, like not everyone had a school that was as open to facilitating those independent studies. But what I will say is that for the most part, there, um, I think almost any student can, if they have the time and the willingness, can find opportunities to, you know, take a, an independent study and to do something on their own. And if, even if it's not, again, sort of meant, like, you know, by the school and sort of in a school program, what I think a classic example of sort of a first opportunity for an independent study ends up honestly being in the sciences. Like, truthfully, it might be hard to find, if you're not doing it in school, of independent study in the histories or the social sciences. And that's honestly totally okay, because you can eventually go to college and, and do that kind of work there. But in the sciences, um, there tends to be a lot of high school students nowadays who will go into research. And to get into research, I think the most sort of interesting learning that I picked up in high school and it's something that I think almost every university researcher, like any undergraduate, learns pretty quickly once they join college. That to you know do research in college or even in high school, it's a big part of it. It's sort of just to get your foot in the door is um, to just cold email people. And even for that science research project that I did for the you know last two years of my high school, it was a cold email to a bunch of professors. And, um, you know, I got a couple leads and it was this professor that I got to meet with one summer and we chatted about my interests and his work at his lab. And that's how I sort of began that project. But, you know, nowadays, especially as we sort of entered into this virtual COVID environment, in general, if there's, you know, a topic that's interesting to you, do some research. And if you find a professor or sort of an academic who's doing some cool work, you know, ultimately, I think there's a lot to be said as a young person um, in sort of taking that first step, sending out a cold email, and even if it's just a conversation to start and you don't even, you know, most likely don't even ask for that internship or that independent study, potentially a lot of these times they will lead to some sort of experience for you to get that real world, you know, work um, opportunity. And I think that um, just to maybe sum up that independent study question, even if whether or not your school offers um, a facilitated independent study, um, it doesn't hurt to you know find things that interest you or people that interest you and just to go reach out to them um, to you know learn from them or just have a conversation. Okay, okay. Well, um, thanks uh, for that, Ishan. Again, uh, I would like to tell all the students that uh, listen, uh, we're going to get to Ishan sort of, you know, how he got into Harvard, but what made him think of Harvard and sort of all the other things that I'm sure everyone's trying to also, um, you know, get into. But um, one thing is that, of course, you have to be committed throughout high school, right? If, if you're hearing this conversation, Ishan was editor-in-chief of, of, you know, the school newspaper, which, by the way, is a humongous task. I, I remember my Phillips Academy days and how serious uh, journalism really was and how those long nights of, you know, editors, editor-in-chief, like sitting together, working on different pieces. Um, that's one. He talked about debating. He talked about Model United Nations and how he sort of got a club uh, to his school and independent study and all the athletics that goes with, you know, the strong AP courses that Ishan was taking. So a well-rounded student overall. Um, and thanks for sharing those insights with us, Ishan, especially about the independent study. Um, now let's, let's get to something interesting. And we'll talk a little bit about Harvard and next 15, 20 minutes. I just want to deep dive into, um, you know, how and, you know, what made you sort of go to Harvard. So the first thing um, I would like to ask you is at what age did you first start thinking about Harvard or college? And why did you end up picking 
uh, first applying and then going to Harvard, um, especially as a computer science major, or is that something you chose yeah. later on? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I don't know, truthfully, like what I will say is, you know, I've grown up in Boston and certainly Boston is known for its universities, but to a certain extent, as much as Harvard and MIT and Tufts and these great schools around here were a part of my sort of childhood, as a result of them being always around, I honestly didn't really think about these schools in terms of like, oh, I really want to apply here until really ninth grade or even later in high school. And I think for me, what I really, you know, as a child, what I really enjoyed was there were these amazing, you know, universities that were just offering really cool programs. And so rather than thinking about, oh, like, how do I get into Harvard? How do I get into MIT or these schools? My experiences with, with them early on it was, you know, doing these interesting camps and programs. And because they were just so ubiquitous in the area, I think a lot of students have a similar experience to me if they're living in the Boston area where, because Harvard is all around you, you haven't thought about it in that way until you, I think, hit high school and then maybe college gets pushed on you a little bit more. But, uh, but you know, when I was in high school and when I started to think about college, I certainly thought about Harvard, you know, immediately. And I think almost, you know, every student, maybe even around the world, I, don't, I won't go as far as to say that, but certainly in the Boston area, thinks about Harvard because it is, again, you know, maybe originally it's just a part of their life. And then then afterwards, when they're applying, they're like, okay, this is a great school, obviously. I think what makes, you know, maybe sets aside Dolan Hill is that the college process is um, tremendously done. It's done really well. And it's very much like run um, as like a partnership between the kids and their college counselors. And the counselors that we have at Belmont Hill end up working really closely with us. And I think the key is that um, because we end up having that really close relationship with our counselors, we end up having a very sort of targeted admissions process where um, I think students of Belmont Hill tended to apply to schools that really fit their interests and their sort of backgrounds and what they were looking for. And, and I think ultimately that was the case for me for sure, where I didn't apply to Harvard solely because it was Harvard. I think I ultimately had a, you know, a opportunity to look at other schools, but I ended up applying to Harvard early and so Harvard has this opportunity to apply, um, you know, right in, um, uh, I guess, October, at the end no, of October, first, and yeah. you hear back instead of in December, rather than the typical, you know, date of when you hear back, which is in March for most schools. And I applied early to Harvard. And, and for me, the sort of like thought process and the calculus, calculus that sort of went in my head was you know, for one, I was very um, interested in going to a school that was sort of similarly an opportunity for me to engage in the liberal arts. And I, and for that reason, like, I kind of immediately ruled out schools that were sort of technically focused, so like the MITs and the Caltechs, and even some of those bigger state schools that really put you into, a, you know, a particular sort of major that you have to do. I knew I wanted to go to a liberal arts school where you were in like a college of arts and sciences, which typically, you know, when you hear, you know, the term college of arts and sciences, it typically means that when you're going to that kind of school, you know, you don't have to pick what you're studying until you get to that school. And I was really excited about that. Um, so that, that was kind of on the sort of um, the topic of like, what kind of school academically that I want to go to it was definitely liberal arts. In terms of what kind of schools I want to go to um, size wise, I knew that I didn't want to go to a school that was massive, like a state school, um, having sort of toured some of them. Um, but at the same time, um, I wanted to go to a school that was bigger than Belmont Hill. And so that kind of ruled out um, the liberal arts schools, the NESCACs, and some of those smaller schools that you might hear about in the New England area. Um, and ultimately, that kind of left me with sort of the middle sized schools as being really exciting to me. And Harvard certainly fits that bill. We have 6,400 undergraduates, um, and we're a much bigger graduate school population, but that size for an undergraduate college is quite manageable. And as an undergraduate now, I can you know, pretty safely say that even if you don't know a student in the college, um, I'm, it's almost certain that someone that you know knows that student. So you're almost always two degrees away. And I think having that sort of 
anonymity coupled with still being able to know your community was really exciting to me. And then I think more sort of towards the culture of Harvard, there were like a couple of key areas that really drew me to the school. One was that it was a school that prides itself on its intellectual diversity. And, you know, I was looking at a bunch of other schools, like definitely given my CX background, my counselors and my friends were, you know, were asking and wondering, you know, would I, was I interested in Stanford at all? And it was a school that I had toured and that I had visited, you know, when I was in high school, oops, sorry, there's a little bug down there. But when I was in high school, um, I had been doing these developer conferences um, through Apple that Apple had offered. I was a scholarship winner for their Worldwide Developers Conference, which took place every summer. And I got to do it twice. And both of those times, you know, through high school, I had a chance um, to tour Sanford. And I really enjoyed, um, the, the, obviously, the atmosphere. But I recognized that when I went on those tours, that Sanford was a school that is liberal arts, definitely in its mindset, but has a, a large CS focus where many of its students are CS plus something else. And what drew me to Harvard was the fact that not everyone was a CS student. And in fact, that, um, that there were students, you know, studying history and engineering and the social sciences and a whole bunch of other concentrations that maybe I hadn't even heard about. And um, that diversity of sort of intellectual thought was really compelling to me. Um, and then the sort of final cultural, you know, touching stone that got me to apply to Harvard was I thought that the community aspect of the school was awesome. It truly is a residential campus. You know, 97% of Harvard College, you know, undergraduates live on campus in the residential housing system where first years live in Harvard Yard at the center of the campus. And then from your sophomore year onwards, you're sort of sorted Harry Potter style into one of 12 upperclassmen houses. And um, that idea for me that almost everyone was on campus together and living and learning together was really exciting to have that sort of community feel. And so it was that community aspect, the intellectual diversity, um, and you know the sort of size and sort of more logistical factors all together that you know, got me to apply to Harvard. And then I think the sort of final drop in the bucket was for looking at myself, I was someone who was interested in honestly staying close to home. And that's a question that I think a lot of people as they're applying to college start to think about is, you know, do you want to go further away from home? I know for those of you applying from overseas, obviously a lot of those colleges, almost all of them will be quite a far plane ride away. In my case, obviously Harvard's only six miles away, so it's almost too close. But truthfully, because of the community in the residential campus, um, I really do feel like I'm at my own college experience when I'm at Harvard. And the way I saw it, I thought that going to Harvard and going to a school that actually had a solid population of Amon Hill alums and sort of a support network, for me, meant that I would have, um, you know, a community to sort of welcome me immediately and to sort of provide some guidance. And then from there, um, sort of grow into my own person. Um, but at the same time, my brother ended up going to the University of Chicago. And for him, he really did want to find a place that was um, sort of entirely different and sort of separate from the current ecosystem we lived in. And so there's pros and cons to both. And I think both of us have um, really enjoyed leaning into the, the schools that we chose. Okay. Well, a lot of interesting things about why you would want to get, come to Harvard. Can you tell me one thing or to students why you wouldn't want, uh, you know, recommend students to come to Harvard? What would that one reason be? Yeah, okay, that's, all right. And I feel like truthfully, there's so many great reasons and I, I think you can find a lot of them online. So I'm gonna try to find, I think one sort of tying in my passion for histories and it's an obscure reason. And the reason I'm keeping it obscure is I feel like you can, like I said, you can find a lot of these other reasons online. But I, as someone who's interested in history, am always sort of blown away and excited by the, like the fact that Harvard's history is so well documented and so accessible. And then to top it all off, that by being sort of a student at Harvard, 
you in many ways are sort of the agents of change that are sort of writing your own history as well. And I'll give a couple, I can definitely give a couple examples. Um, but I think, you know, across the board, what I, what I mean by that is like Harvard is the United States' oldest college um, and oldest institution of higher education. And as a result, it has a history that sort of mimics the United States history or parallels it in many ways. And it's very intertwined with that history for better or worse. And as someone who's interested in history, it's amazing to be able to dig into the Crimson, our school newspaper, or just the general archives in our library, and to be able to sort of learn about my school and the school that I'm living in and to see how it's connected to that broader experience. Um, and that has been really exciting for me. I think the other sort of big sell for why Harvard is that I, it's talking to my friends, um, again, besides the residential experience and the fact that everyone lives together and learns together, it's I've yet to hear about a school that has such a robust extracurricular sort of culture and environment. Like at Harvard, what's really amazing is I think the students take pride in whatever they do. And in particular, in the clubs that they're a part of. And as a result, we have these amazing clubs that sort of span the gamut of things that, you know, students might be interested in from pre-professional work to sort of social work and then in general, just sort of any, anything, you know, under the sun. Um, I think Harvard kids really enjoy those extracurriculars beyond their academics and they sort of take it to, you know, as far an extent as possible. And many students, you know, extracurriculars become the sort of key element of their sort of Harvard undergraduate life. And so my big sells for the school are if you like history, you can definitely find a lot of it there. And if you want to make history, you can do that in the clubs that are at Harvard. Okay, well, like history and make history. That's, that's a good way to go about it. Um, coming back to that question, I actually also wanted to ask you, what's one thing you would tell students why not to come to Harvard? Like, why would that be uh, not their dream school if they are in one particular thing or the other? What, what would that be? Yeah, if, okay. I think you should not come to Harvard if you want to feel like you're the smartest student in the room or if you want to go just to the best school because it's number one on the list. What I'm trying to get at is that I think for a lot of people, Harvard is like synonymous with like excellence and with, um, you know, sort of the gold standard. And that's obviously a great thing to aspire to. But at the same time, what I will say, and I hope that, you know, if you ever get a chance to tour Harvard or to meet other students, this will be the case as well. I do really think that Harvard students, um, you know, are not coming to Harvard for just the brand name or the ranking, but because they are genuinely interested in learning. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, one question that I'm asked is like, you know, why do you think you're going to Harvard? And I think it's the same answer that most likely most Harvard students would be able to give. They might give it slightly differently, but at the end of the day, I think we're all intellectually curious people who, you know, whatever we're specifically interested in doing, we're excited about learning more, about asking questions, and about, you know, working with others and learning from others. And so I think if you were trying to go to Harvard to show everyone that you're the smartest, um, it might not be the right place for you, just because at Harvard, you never feel like you're the smartest person. And that's an amazing thing to have, the opportunity to always feel like you're not the smartest. Okay, um, cool. So, what did, what did you think, Ishan, in, when you were applying and in your applications, uh, personally, and this is getting a little deeper into probably the Common App or applications in general, what is that one thing you think you highlighted uh, the most? And we're going to get to the Common App essay as well very quickly, uh, because I know how important that is uh, for colleges in the U.S., because you get only 650 words. They want to really... They want you to deep dive into something that you are, have not told them through your academic transcripts or you've not told them through the activity section, which is there. Um, I'm sure you must have filled all the 10 activity sections that you, you know, the space that you do get. So what did you personally think of writing in the Common App? And in general, what did you think was that one factor to your applications that you were trying to highlight to Harvard or to any other college that you were applying to? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I actually read my application. Harvard and all these other universities have like a, an ability for students to go and read their materials. 
Um, and it was, it was, I mean, certainly there's still things that I'm unclear about, but it was really eye-opening to be able to sort of see my application even more than their comments to see my own writing again. And at the end of the day, the Common App, as I think you alluded to, um, especially the essays, are really an opportunity to sort of let the admissions officers get to know you beyond your sort of scores and curriculars and sort of the, the you know, resume bullets on your application. And so for that reason, what I was really trying to highlight in my application was what I sort of discussed with, you know, you a little bit earlier in the conversation, which is, I, I think in high school really felt like what I enjoyed was making connections between the sort of different areas of interest that I had. And in particular, you know, some of those key areas were history, Latin, and computer science. And so I had one essay that I wrote, which was about the web of connections and was about actually nothing about computer science in this essay. It was about an interview that I had with um, this, uh, you know, former businessman and sort of um, uh, entrepreneur who actually um, helped Belmont Hill acquire this really old chapel to become our meeting house. So in 1963, we bought this chapel for $1. Um, and we're a secular school, we're not religious, but we, we, it was during the sort of federal like highway act in the US where um, the, you know, the government was actually ripping apart cities and towns to build these national highways. And so a lot of these buildings were getting sort of foreclosed and torn down and Belmont Hill bought this chapel from Connecticut and brought it over. And this, this man at the time was a recent um, Harvard Business School graduate and happened to have started this construction company and he was the one in charge of it. And, you know, he recently sadly passed away, but at the time when I met him, I was a junior in high school and he was maybe 83 or 84 years old. And my essay was really centered around my conversation with him, learning about the sort of um, background of my school's chapel and, uh, you know, doing that as a journalist, as an editor-in-chief of my paper. And then from there, sort of more generally diving into how I'm really interested in exploring these different connections. And then it kind of led to me being able to talk about the rest of my um, high school experience in that essay. And that was my Common App essay. Um, and the topic was like the, the topic that I chose was like the no topic essay where like it was of your own desire, of your own creation. So there was no like specific prompt that I was following other than my own. And then um, for Harvard, I think every school beyond the sort of general Common App essay has their own supplements. And Harvard is amongst the sort of lighter end of the spectrum in terms of not that men, you know, many extra supplements are needed. Um, there's like two very small 250 words sort of um, questions about sort of extracurriculars that you're a part of and things that you're passionate about. And there's like one more slightly longer essay, again, trying to just get, you know, who you are. And it was in that essay that I talked about um, my experience and sort of interests in um, the classics and in computer science and how they actually helped each other out. And so it was, um, it was uh, I think it was titled from months to MOOCs and the reasoning, MOOCs being massive open online courseware, um, the reason for that being that I had been taking a Latin course where we were studying medieval Latin and um, written by monks. And um, it was a really interesting course. And there was actually a couple of concepts that I learned there about how we date texts and how we sort of problem solve to figure out, you know, um, some questions that we had about the Latin that ultimately helped me at a sort of internship experience um, at this massive open online courseware company called edX that um, actually is the one that serves CS50 online for you know, millions of users. And so it was a really cool experience for me to be able to share to the admissions officers um, my interest in Latin and computer science and how, at least to myself, I felt that I was learning from Latin things that I could use in computer science and vice versa, being able to translate and do Latin better because I was um, a computer scientist. And so across the board in those essays where I felt like I was able to sort of de demonstrate to the admissions officers was that, you know, I was a student who had a lot of interesting passions, but um, more than anything was excited about exploring the connections between those passions. Okay. 
Great. Um, well, that's funny when you mentioned the web of things because my essay for the Common App was also sort of titled something on like the web of things where I was talking about how every person is sort of connected. And, you know, I gave an example of how I was actually driving from um, uh, uh, Boston to Brooklyn and, uh, you know, to watch a game and, and a cab driver from Haiti uh, who had sort of emigrated, told me, offered me a job if my college plans don't work out. I talked about, about, about a guy in my class from Moldova and, uh, you know, how I used to think that he's very sort of shy and, and you know, didn't really talk to anyone, but how he wanted to become the president of, of Moldova and, you know, was really, you know, about a, a ping pong uh, sort of a game that we had. And in the end, sort of tied it up as to how I think that we are all connected, not just in the bytes of, you know, the World Wide Web, but uh, sort of a, a human web, actually. That was the the title of my, my Common App essay as well. So yeah. very, very interesting. I'm glad you sort of mentioned all these things, uh, Ishan, because a lot of times, um, you know, it's very different to the statement of purpose that um, a lot of universities in the UK want, where, you know, you really are just explaining them in a thousand words, what have you done so far uh, from your high school to college? Uh, I mean, to your from your freshman year to your senior year, but in the Common App and specifically for Harvard, um, and then in the general Common App essay, how you're really describing the things that you are and you're interested in, and how that comes right. out to be, you know, a story on leadership, on a story on curiosity, right. and how that's right. really, uh, yeah. A great point that you mentioned. Now that I think about it, I actually never once mentioned Harvard in any of my essays ever. And so probably a key point of departure from any sort of European school um, is that oh, for a lot of these liberal arts colleges in the U.S., they almost don't even ask you, I guess maybe this is a little bit, um, don't take my advice too literally, because certainly a big part of these essays is um, to demonstrate your interest in the school. And for a lot of schools, especially smaller schools, um, they want to see how are you interested in the school and why are you applying there. So certainly most times when there's supplements that you know offer you an opportunity to talk about the school, you most definitely should talk about the school. I think I will say maybe just from my experience applying to Harvard that that this one school um, doesn't really care as much about why Harvard, more as to like why you would be a good fit for Harvard based on what you're doing. And so I think I was still trying to explain why Harvard, but in my case, I was able to do that without even saying that I want to go to Harvard. It was pretty clear that I wanted to go to Harvard by nature of applying early and sort of my activities and what I was doing and what I wanted to do at Harvard. But more than anything, what I really wanted to show them in the essays was what I was interested in and like who I was as a person. Okay. Um, okay, now for some some fun stuff. Um, okay, what what about the food at Harvard? Um, um, in, in a quick say, what would be that one word you describe for the food at Harvard? And uh, do you like it? Uh, it's good. Or is, yeah. is food a big part of your campus life in general? Yes, yes. Food is a huge part of our campus life. Um, I, it's kind of uh, cheating, but I feel like community oriented. I don't know why that's the first thing that comes into my mind. But when I think about food, I think about community at Harvard. And that's because um, unlike a lot of other schools, a lot of other universities, Harvard has a sort of unlimited dining meal plan that almost every single student has. You either are on the meal plan or you're not. There's no in between. And again, 90 plus percent of us are on the meal plan. And what that means is that you can eat at any one of the 12 residential houses. And as a freshman, you eat in this really cool dining hall um, that looks a lot like the Hogwarts dining hall. And with good reason, because both the Hogwarts dining hall and Annenberg Hall, which is the name of our freshman dining hall, are, um, you know, modeled after um, Christ Church's college in England. So there's a little bit of a cousin relationship there. But, you know, particularly community oriented, as I said, because um, a lot of sort of Harvard social interactions are centered around hanging out with friends or like going and catching up with someone over a meal. And it's because Harvard makes everyone get that unlimited meal plan that um, you're able to have that happen. So I actually really do enjoy the food at Harvard. I, think, I couldn't have asked for anything better. There's always going to be dissent and always going to be kids who don't like the food. 
But truthfully, I think Harvard does a really great job with their meal plans. Um, and I think that besides that, there's also an amazing sort of array of restaurants and takeout places in Harvard Square. And in that sense, Harvard truly is a school in a city and a city in a school where, um, where you really have Harvard Square as this like city experience directly integrated with the residential college. That's funny. I, you know, my first visit, and, and this is, it's funny because in 2007 uh, was the first year when I actually straight from the Boston airport uh, landed up at the Murr Center, I think, which is the Harvard, you know, squash courts. And that was my first introduction to the U.S., to Boston and to Harvard and, and sort of all of those three connected together. Um, one question uh, would be about your interview as well. Were you interviewed for Harvard? Um, did you do that process? And if you yeah. could quickly uh, maybe share that one thing again that sort of stood out in your interview and you thought that you were able to, you know, put, bring your point across to the interviewer and you thought something that was really important that right. you highlighted during the interview. Yeah, that's a great point. I will say to, as a preface, not just to the interview question, but honestly, in general, I think, um, you know, there's often a feeling, you know, if, you know, what you hear one kid's story about how he applied or got into Harvard, and you're like, wow, it sounds so different from how my current application process is going. What I will say is that, um, you know, Harvard definitely takes into account, and all schools take into account, you know, or try to, um, the sort of educational background and the sort of circumstances that you're coming from. So if your school doesn't offer AP or doesn't offer this specific program, there's no expectation that you're going to be doing that. It's really based on what the circumstances for your life were and what you were able to do with what you were offered. So they really are looking at um, what you, your abilities were, again, in your constraints. In the case of an interview, I only mention that because um, Harvard tries to interview as many applicants as possible and I think for those who are living abroad, obviously there's fewer alumni abroad, although we have a pretty large network. And so a lot of students abroad still get interviewed. But what I will say is it doesn't mean that you will not get in if you do not get an interview. In the case of you know, my experience, I obviously am just six miles away from Harvard. So there's quite a few Harvard alumni around the area. And so most students in the Boston area get an interview. But it, again, it, there's no sort of extra... Um, you don't get an advantage just because you're in Boston. It's just that because we're here, we get the interview. And in my case, though, the interview was actually held at my school, which is slightly unique even for the U.S. Typically, interviews for colleges are held um, at, uh, you know, coffee shops and wherever the interviewers who are typically alumni feel most comfortable to host you in like a public area. And in our case, um, I think partly just as a tradition that we've sort of had for a very long time, um, the admissions officers for Harvard, when you apply early, they actually, we all, and all the kids from Belmont Hill who apply early to Harvard, um, interview on the very same day. Um, and we go to the headmaster's house um, because they're part boarding. And we have a couple of different interviewers and you, it's still a normal interview process where you go one at a time and you have like that maybe 30 minute conversation with your interviewer. You know, it was actually really great to read my notes um, that my interviewer wrote because it was an awesome conversation. Um, my interviewer had gone to the college and then gone to the business school afterwards as well and had a, she had a very entrepreneurial sort of career. Um, but it really is just an opportunity for, again, just like the Common App essays, for you to get to explain to the interviewer and essentially to Harvard, like who you are as a person and what drives you um, with sort of the key motivating factor being, as I mentioned earlier, Harvard is really interested in finding kids who are intellectually curious, I think, at the end of the day. And honestly, the, one of the most interesting things was, um, you know, what I think my interviewer was really trying to understand when she was speaking with me is not just um, what I did and, like, and, you know, to what level I did it, although that was obviously a key understanding was, like, what were the things I did and, like, where did I get with it? But I think more importantly, why did I do what I did? And I think that's a really hard thing for high school students and for anyone to really figure out. And truthfully, even when I look back at my notes, I don't think I really knew exactly why I was doing everything that I was doing. And I don't think my interviewer expected that for sure. Like she knows, she knew, and I think people know that in high school, you don't know everything for sure. You barely know anything. 
And so they weren't expecting us to have that answer. But if you are, you know, those students who are applying right now and you're thinking about an interview, I think if you are able to articulate why you're interested in what you're doing, that is a really mature um, understanding that interviewers will really appreciate. And if you can have that, you're already better than I am on my interview. Okay. Um, well, I, I know we're running out of time, but last couple of questions, and, and this one is uh, sort of on financial aid. We won't get into sort of the deeper meanings and maybe in, in other sessions, we could talk more about financial aid for international students. But um, just as a student, as an American student, if you had a chance, if you got so only 50% aid at Harvard, I know that wouldn't happen because, you know, Harvard is a need blind school um, compared to, you know, a, a full scholarship somewhere else. Um, would you still choose Harvard or what would be the reason? Could you sort of, because a lot of our students in India have that dilemma, right? That they are getting into their dream school and, and or the Ivy Leagues, uh, which of course they're all aspiring to go to. And then they get into a school like um, maybe Georgia Tech, for an example, right? Hypothetically, and they get full aid there or a lot more aid there and they just choose Harvard or any other school or Cornell, for example, which does not really offer that much international aid. Uh, what would you tell to those students? I know it's really personal, but what would your understanding be? Yeah, it is a really tough question. And obviously, certainly for those students living abroad, it becomes sort of exponentially tougher. I mean, at the end of the day, it really, I sort of, my, my sort of tough answer is that it really kind of comes down to the circumstances of your family and sort of what best sort of risk profile and sort of financial profile fits your needs. Like, I think that, um, one thing for sure about the colleges in the U.S. is that at the end of the day, they're all, you know, very prestigious and they all end up, you know, regardless of which school you go to, like rankings aside, they actually are top notch places and you really come out with a lot of growth. So with that in mind, like you aren't going to go wrong with these schools. I'm sure you guys will get into amazing schools. Um, and I, you hinted at this as well. Honestly, it's a tough question to answer because it's almost a uh, hypothetical that's very hard to actually happen. And the reason I mentioned that and my tour guide is coming out in me is that, you know, actually over like 60% of our, just about 60% of um, Harvard families are on some sort of financial aid and 20% pay nothing at all. And so if you make under 65,000 US dollars, you typically pay zero. And so for many Harvard undergraduates, Harvard actually ends up becoming the cheapest option out of any of the schools they ever go to. Um, and they get, you know, it's need blind. Um, and now it's actually need blind for international students as well, I believe. Um, and as a result, what it means is that, you know, you're instead of being offered a loan and sort of going into some sort of debt, Harvard and a lot of other schools nowadays offer you like grants, and which means that you never pay it back. You get to go to the school for, you know, a price that is affordable for you. And so I, I will say that if, if, if for some hypothetical reason that this doesn't work out, I think that if you, once you have this discussion with the family, you, it's really up to you. And I don't think there's anything wrong about choosing a school that's giving you more money. Um, as long as, you know, along with the money side of it, you feel like it's a school that fits your sort of um, academic and extracurricular and sort of personal interests. But at the same time, hopefully that might not even be the case because Harvard tends to be one of the most generous sort of schools in terms of financial aid out there. Got it. Wow. Uh, I had very similar circumstances as well. I was just glad I got, I was part of the Davis World Scholarship as well, which sort of uh, came through Andover, but it, it was, I was eligible to apply to, I think, 80, 85 colleges, which are part of the Davis uh, World Scholar Program. And, and those scholarships then, you know, uh, transferred to my colleges as well. So I was very thankful for that. Clearly, I would have not been able to go to Phillips Academy or um, Cornell after that without those scholarships. So now a little more interesting stuff about Ishan. What are Ishan three bucket list items for you um, now moving forward? What are three things that you would say on, on top of your bucket list that you really want to do? Yeah, such a good question. Um, okay, the first thing for sure, and it's, uh, the reason I think about it is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm actually on a gap year right now. So um, gap year meaning that I'm, I guess gap year or a leave of absence, you can call it, but I'm, I'm actually like not enrolled at Harvard at this moment. 
Um, Harvard itself has a very liberal leave of absence policy where you can officially be on leave for up to 10 years and return as long as you leave in good standing as in you leave um, without you know some disciplinary action like you can tell Harvard that I'm leaving right now and you never actually tell them when you're coming back until 12 weeks before the next term so um, Harvard for no student does Harvard know when they're coming back until they're ready to come back and for me, I'm thinking I'm just taking just this year off. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working full time right now and into January. But beyond that, my hope and my sort of first bucket list item is next semester, um, I'm trying to go with a couple of friends. And for Rishi, who knows some of my friends, they also are in YLC. Andrew and Michael and John Luke and I are all trying um, to road trip the national parks in California together. And right now, that, that sort of bucket list item for me is, I haven't really been on a great American road trip yet, and I really want to do that. And in particular, we want to rent an RV or figure out how to get an RV for cheap and be able to sort of live together. And if anything, we really want to be able to teach some you know, virtual conferences for YLC, and then at the same time, travel the California national parks. And so that's my, you know, definite sort of short term, like coming up soon, hopefully bucket this item that I think I can, you know, make happen this coming semester. Um, my, you know, bucket this item for when I get back to Harvard um, is um, one that most likely will never happen in its entirety, but it's a goal that I think in aspiring to do this um, will like make me have an even more amazing experience at Harvard. And it's that I want to meet every single like a uh, classmate in my grade of class of 2022. I guess at this point it becomes a little bit harder now that COVID has sort of kept us virtual. And um, truthfully, when I say me, I don't mean like just uh, get their name and their handshake because actually like the, like Harvard has this thing called the Facebook, which is um, the same name as obviously that big social media service now. And it is with good reason, obviously, given that Mark Zuckerberg went to, to Harvard, but the Harvard Facebook has all of our names. And so I could have just looked up the names and memorized that if I wanted to just know everyone. But what I want to do is to genuinely like have a conversation and ideally if I could and I had the time, like have a meal given that Harvard is so meal centered with my entire grade. And I'm assuming that I won't be able to do it. It's 1600 kids, which is not that large a number, but it's still quite big. Um, and so my thought is that while I can't probably get to all 1600, if I make an effort and if I, um, you know, have that sort of mindset coming back to Harvard next fall, my hope is that I'll, you know, come out of my four years or I guess at this point, five years of Harvard with, um, I don't know, a more enriched experience where at the end of the day, Harvard is a school defined by its people, whether that's the professors, the sort of people who support us and then the students. And um, I think it'd be a real bummer if I didn't get to meet my fellow students. Um, and then my third, uh, my third bucket list item is, well, okay, honestly, I do at some point in my life want to live full time in India. And I had hoped that it would have been this summer, I would have been living in Mumbai. Um, and, you know, I come to India uh, typically once a year and live with my family. But the goal for me would have been to sort of be living and working relatively autonomously and to sort of have my own sort of independent experience in India. And so while I wasn't able to do it, you know, in person this year, um, it was great to sort of have an, a virtual internship experience in India. And at the same time, it's still on my bucket list to, um, you know, work um, full time uh, in India as well. Okay. Well, I'll let you go. Last question, um, Ishan. What is that one advice you would want to give high schoolers who are aspiring? Um, and also just to let you know, after the last YLC conference we did um, over the summer, I know at least four or five students from that group who are applying to Harvard this year, right? Just by being inspired by all of you. What would be just one advice in general um, that you would give to high schoolers right now who are listening to you? And Maybe that one thing that you feel if you were in high school, again, in, even though you just graduated a couple of years back, what would you do back in high school? Yeah, 
That's a great question as well. And, and hopefully, as you mentioned, this won't be the sort of end of our conversation. Unfortunately, it's the end for tonight, but or this morning in India, but we'll, we'll continue this at some point. Um, the advice I definitely give to the high schoolers is like, don't spend time thinking as much as it's easy to do so, don't spend time thinking about what others are doing and really focus about, you know, developing yourself and whatever you find interesting, really digging into it. And like I said, like finding that sort of curiosity in yourself and, you know, really honing it because at the end of the day, like it's your life to live and colleges are not, um, I really do think that, you know, there's many ways to live your life, but I don't want to go too philosophical, but um, I think the sort of, a life that is sort of defined by, you know, what you're interested in and sort of um, your sort of own curiosity is one that's a lot better lived than one that's defined by looking at others and trying to mimic them. And so hopefully that's like, again, not the end of this conversation, but a really good starting point for, for others. If this is where we're going to, you know, tap it for now, where, you know, look to see what you're interested in and, and go and, and try to sort of make those things happen. And I think that'll be a lot more fulfilling and, you know, looking at others and trying to see what they do. Perfect. Well, I, I would say the same thing. I think uh, when I was a seventh grader, in, and that's funny, Ishan, uh, a similarity with you and I as well, that I actually joined Mayo College, which is an all boys boarding school in India in seventh grade um, and was in boarding, uh, you know, throughout and, and sort of played squash, got into Phillips Academy and then Cornell and, and sort of back in India now. But Thank you so much for your time. I, I'm really glad we got to do this. And I'm sure a lot of students would appreciate your, you know, just how candid you were in this conversation, your tips, um, you know, for the Common App, for Harvard in general, and just life, uh, you know, in general. So thank you so much for that.